which uh, I've called Daniel Rowlands, the shining star of the Welsh revivals. And uh, it's, it's an interesting thing, this, this man, Daniel Rowlands. Sometimes you'll see his name spelled without the S, Daniel Rowland. Uh, most often, I think, with an S. Uh, but the, the question arises, who is this man? And uh, there's relatively little known about him, really, compared with some of the other characters in the history of the church. Um, that's for several reasons. The first is that he ministered for uh, over 50 years, which is a long period of time, but as we will see, in a tiny, tiny village in the middle of Wales. Um, and he was very much the pastor of uh, a church in that area. Many people came to hear him preach, but he didn't travel around. Uh, you remember how uh, George Whitfield crossed the Atlantic, I think, six or seven times, return trips into the United States. He was in Scotland, he was in Wales. Um, that wasn't the nature of Daniel Rowland's ministry. He stayed very much within uh, Wales uh, for most of his life as a minister. Um, also, he wrote very little. He was a preacher. He was a pastor. And uh, most of the sermons that he preached, he preached from just a, a very small piece of paper, smaller than, uh, than this bulletin sheet, certainly, with just a few bullet points on, that is what he would use. So we only actually have about a dozen of his sermons. Um, those are probably out of print now. And he wrote them in Welsh. And uh, the translation that has been done, my understanding of it is, if you can find a copy, uh, what you will find is that... Um, his style of delivery was very short and very powerful, very clipped sentences, very, uh, very terse in a way. Uh, but to suit the, uh, the characteristic of the age when the translation was done, they've turned it into very flowery and, and ornate uh, intellectual kind of stuff, which really uh, doesn't give you a good impression of the ministry and the power of the ministry that he exercised. So um, the translations really haven't done justice to his expression. Uh, the Countess of Huntingdon comes up time and time again in all of these lectures. She was a very prominent figure uh, during the Great Awakening. And she gathered a lot of documents about the life of Daniel Rowlands, intending uh, that it would be documented for the future. Uh, but she passed away herself before that could be done. And uh, the papers subsequently disappeared. And it was several years before anybody realized that she had them. And then they looked for them. And they have never been found. So that's a little bit of a problem when you come to, to lecture on a man like this. That means that uh, we're going to be a little bit scanty on precise dates. And we're going to probably be more in the realm of anecdotes and, and eyewitness accounts than perhaps we had to be uh, with Whitfield, with Top Lady, and with Wesley. But to give you an idea of you know, why should we study a man who, you know, who whoever really has heard of Daniel Rowlands? Um, he doesn't, he's not even a George Whitfield, and George Whitfield himself was somewhat obscure compared with a John Wesley. Uh, well, I thought it would be good to take a look at what some of his contemporaries said about him, wondering whether you've come out uh, for no good reason uh, tonight to hear about basically an unknown character who has little to teach us in this day and age. Here's what Whitfield says. Last year, I visited several places, that is in South Wales, uh, but now I went to more and in every place found that not one half had been told me. The power of God at the sacrament under the ministry of Mr. Rowlands was enough to make a person's heart to burn within him. At seven of the morning, 
I have seen perhaps 10,000 from different parts in the midst of a sermon crying, Gogonian Bendigadig, ready to leap for joy. These are Welsh words, needless to say. <laughs> Glory and praise are probably the closest we can get to them in English. And a warning for those of you who are in the, the front couple of rows here. I'm going to try and pronounce some of the Welsh words and place names in the very near future. So having brought an umbrella could have been a good idea. It's not an easy language to pronounce, and I'm sufficiently far from my wife to be able to say this with impunity at the moment. But it's a beautiful language. It's a very lilting language, and I'm, I'm somewhat tempted to, when I get to, to reading some of the portions of his sermons, which have been better translated than, uh, than the ones I mentioned earlier, you can almost, if, if you're familiar with the, the, the Welsh accent, you can hear, even in an English translation, the rhythm. And it, it may be difficult for me to avoid adopting something of a, a, the Welsh uh, intonation as, as I read them. We'll see how that goes. But that's what Whitfield thought. Note this word, or, or this phrase, the power of God. Because... Throughout his ministry, one thing that was said of Daniel Rowlands is that the power of God consistently attended his preaching. Well, let's see what uh, Howell Harris had to say, another Welshman, and one who was very much connected with Whitfield and uh, with the, the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist movement. On hearing the uncommon gifts given him, and the amazing power and authority by which he spoke, and the effects it had on the people, I was made indeed thankful, and my heart burst with love to God and to him. Here began my acquaintance with him, and to all eternity it shall never end. Then uh, there was uh, an older minister called John Williams, who had traveled to, um, to Tlangaitha, which is where uh, Rowlands was ministering, to hear him. But having arrived, he'd traveled some way. He was really exhausted. And he thought seriously about just retiring to his bed and not going to hear Rowlands that evening. However, he managed to drag himself out and to hear him preach. And Rowlands preached on Isaiah 25, verse 6, which says, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And John Williams says this. And again, this is, this is very Welsh expression. You never heard such a thing in your life. He began to tap the barrels of the covenant of grace and to let out the wine well refined and to give to the people to drink and it flowed over the chapel. I also drank and I became, as I may say, quite drunk and there, there I was and scores of others in an ecstasy of delight praising God, having forgotten all fatigue and bodily wants. And then lastly, another minister, I think from Bala in the, in the north of Wales, says this, Thomas Charles, I went to hear Mr. Rowland preach at New Chapel, a day much to be remembered by me as long as I live. Ever since the happy day, I have lived in a new heaven and a new earth. The change a blind man who receives his sight experiences doth not exceed the change I at that time experienced in my mind. I think those testimonies from people of such caliber mean that it's well worth our time uh, to spend this evening 
becoming more familiar with this man and with the way that the Lord used him in the revivals in Wales. But the Lord has sealed the ministry of Rowlands with his own testimony. Rowlands ministered for more than 50 years in this tiny village in the middle of Wales. During his ministry, there were no less than seven periods of revival. He drew a congregation of three to 4,000 people every Lord's Day to that tiny little village for 50 years. And for 20 years after his death, while his son, Nathaniel Rowlands, continued the ministry, the attendance was significant in number. People traveled, it said, as far as 60 miles on foot to hear Daniel Rowlands preached. And they would stop at little springs to refresh themselves with the mountain water on the way. And having heard him preach, they would return and they would be singing. If, if you've ever heard a Welsh choir sing, you will know that they sing like no other people. And they would, I'm sure, make the valleys echo. There was a rugby commentator once who used to say when Wales won a rugby match, they'll be singing in the valleys tonight. Well, when they went to hear Daniel Rowlands preach, there was singing in the mountains on their way as they journeyed back 20, 40, 60 miles to their homes. A uh, little bit of orientation. Um, here is the British Isles. Hopefully that's recognizable. That's made up of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Great Britain is made up of Scotland, England, which comes down here, and Wales. And we're focusing on Wales, which is where Daniel Rowlands ministered. And if we zoom in on that box, within Wales, this is the area uh, where Daniel Rowlands conducted his ministry. There's a town on the coast here called Aberystwyth, which is uh, now, uh, I think, still the home probably of the Evangelical Movement of Wales conference every year. The capital city, Cardiff, down here. Um, and then, obviously, Anglesey up in the north. But we're focusing on this little area here, you'll notice that there's, there's virtually nothing in that box. <laughs> but let's zoom in on that. <clears throat> Here, having zoomed in, we have Llangaitho, which is where uh, Daniel Rowlands ministered most of his life. He was actually born, as we'll see, in the parish of Nantkuntli. And uh, we'll see that uh, some fairly significant event, events happened over in this place, Llandui Brevi, uh, which is, you can see, we're talking about four miles here, three or four miles here. Uh, let's take a little closer look at Llangaitho, um, with thanks to the satellite imagery that we have easy access to today. This is part of the village. Uh, today, you'll see that today the astonishing population is 874 people. Um, 300 years ago, it would not have been so large, I imagine. And you try and think about, even today, what it would mean to this little village to have three or 4,000 people descend every Lord's Day. Um, quite a logistical um, problem. The, the church where he ministered is, I haven't been able to find it using Street View, um, but all of the references that I have put it in this area. And this field, which was close to a barn um, in, a, in a farmyard, was an area of significant open air ministry where probably those three or 4,000 people uh, would have been ministered to. We'll see a picture of that uh, shortly. And then over here, uh, at a, a certain point in his life, we'll, we'll come to this later on, uh, Rowlands was thrown out of his church. He, he was curate of Nantkuntli, of Langaitho, and I think of one other uh, congregation. He was thrown out. 
um, and the congregation left with him and built him a chapel, which is here. And uh, that statue that was on the opening slide is that little dot there. Uh, and that's the chapel from which he then uh, conducted the balance of his ministry. <clears throat> so, uh, here's the church in Llangaitho, which I can't find on Google at the moment, but that's what it looked like when it was standing. It, perhaps it isn't there anymore. Um, this is the church at Nantkuntli, and this is very likely the small farmhouse in which he was born in the locality. He was born in 1713 in that parish of Nantkuntli in Cardiganshire. His father was vicar of these two congregations. And uh, when his father passed away, he, uh, his elder brother, John, became uh, the vicar in his place, and Daniel Rowlands became curate, a uh, kind of assistant to the vicar. So the ministry was being conducted mainly by Daniel's older brother, with Daniel assisting. <clears throat> now, uh, his ordination. Uh, that happened when he was 20 years of age. Um, I don't know if you can remember back to that map of the British Isles, but uh, Nantkuntli and Llangaitho are a long, long way from London, and that's where he was ordained. And he walked all the way there and all the way back, probably some 200 miles. <clears throat> uh, he became ordained early on, earlier than usual, perhaps a year sooner than might have been expected, because he was a very gifted scholar, and uh, his superior scholarship was noted. Um, and on returning and taking up his ministry, that's his, his pulpit there in the Flangaitho uh, church, um, he was apparently a very excellent reader of the lessons, imagine that his brother John did much of the preaching, he would read the lessons uh, in the church services. Uh, he also excelled in athletic sports, and back in those days, that's how he and many other people divided their time. They were in church in the morning to do their bit there, and then the balance of the day was their own, and they went out and indulged in all kinds of games and sports and uh, and. Uh, irreligious activities. Sounds a bit like today. <clears throat> and his heart was really in the world. It wasn't in, in the ministry. He enjoyed the sports and the games and uh, the somewhat irreligious living far more than he enjoyed um, being in the church and reading those uh, lessons. However, he was a man of ambition. And he dreamed that he would one day become a very popular preacher. Uh, there was a dissenting preacher in the neighborhood, a man called Mr. Pugh. And uh, Rowlands noticed that he was drawing quite a large congregation uh, to his church. So he went along to see what it was that could possibly explain this, obviously from a human point of view. And uh, he decided that it was because Mr. Pugh thundered when he preached. And uh, so, Rowlands decided that if it was good enough for a dissenting man and if it drew a crowd, then he would do it as well. And so he began thundering. And uh, these are the titles of some of the sermons on which he thundered in those days. Uh, the wicked shall be turned into hell. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? And uh, the interesting thing is that, that it, it worked. It did draw a very large crowd. And this is what one of the historians, this isn't the William Williams, the hymn writer. There are a few William Williams in Wales, and this is uh, not William Williams Pantakellin, 
the hymn writer, but uh, a historian from the 19th century. He says this, uh, he spoke of the sinner's miserable condition of death, judgment, and everlasting torments with such eloquence and power that the church soon became crowded with attentive and awestruck listeners. And it has been said that above a hundred of the congregation were under deep impressions before the preacher himself began to think seriously at all. Uh, and we've seen that on other occasions as well. At the, the truth of the Lord is the truth, and it is powerful truth. And in this case, it's being ministered by somebody who does not know the Lord. Uh, and yet, over a hundred of the congregation coming under deep conviction of sin. Well, a little while later, um, Rollins went to hear a preacher called Griffith Jones, who was an itinerant uh, preacher. He had a, a great work, I think, with some educational aspects. And uh, Rollins went to hear him at that church in Flandui Brevi. And uh, I think in those days, because congregations tended to be quite large and pews tended to limit the number of people you could fit into a building, they would oftentimes take the pews out and the people would stand around the pulpit and listen to the preacher. And so you have to imagine this picture. There is Jones preaching his sermon and there is a very self-assured, self-righteous Daniel Rowland standing in front of him with all the appearance, as Jones thought, of vanity, of conceit, and of levity. He was there uh, to find out what all the fuss was about with this man Griffith Jones, but he knew better. He now knew how to thunder, and uh, he was getting some success from that. Then Jones did something that probably Daniel Rowlands had not anticipated. He stopped his sermon. And he singled out Daniel Rowlands and he prayed for him that the Lord would touch his heart and make him an instrument to save souls. And then he carried on with his sermon. But his arrow had found its mark. And Rowlands was tremendously affected. And uh, I think even on his walk home, those four miles to Flangaitho, uh, it was clear that a whole new seriousness had come about him and that uh, the prayer of this man, Griffith Jones, had, uh, had a, a huge effect upon him. And he was a different character from that day on. But what's interesting is that he still really didn't know how to do anything except to thunder. He still preached the law, the law, the law, the law, the law. And preaching the law is a good thing to do in its place. But there comes a time when you need to do something more and to preach the whole counsel of God. And this same uh, Mr. Pugh, the dissenting minister whose thundering had started Rollins on his own thundering career, said something like this to him, Preach the gospel, my dear sir. He told him that he needed to apply the balm of Gilead to the wounds that the law had inflicted upon the congregation. And you might imagine that the former Daniel Rollins would have scoffed and uh, would have been way too proud to take that advice. But the new Daniel Rowlands, after that prayer from Griffith Jones, took it to heart and humbly accepted the counsel and began to preach the whole gospel, began to preach the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior from sin. And the Lord poured out His Spirit more and more fully on Daniel Rowland's ministry uh, from that time on. Here's that field, I think, uh, close to the village of Flangaitho, where much of Daniel Rowland's open-air ministry took place. And it came about because 
Once he'd been converted, he was very keen uh, that others, particularly those he'd sported with on those Sunday afternoons, would also come to know the Lord. Uh, but those former friends of his were still spending their Lord's days playing games and uh, would not come to hear him preach. So what was he to do? Well, you can imagine what he did do. He went where they were, uh, probably on his own, but he preached to them with such power that they never went back to that place again. And as a place for profaning the Lord's Day, it uh, dropped out of use. And from that time on, uh, Rollins began to minister more in the open air and to take his labors out into the surrounding counties as the opportunity permitted. It'd be interesting now just to take a look at the content of his sermons. I've mentioned that there were only 12 that have been written down. You can get some extracts from uh, some of the sources that I will give you at the end of this lecture. And, and I know that uh, Ryle, in, in his book on the leaders of the 18th century, Christian leaders, quotes from some of these as well, probably from this same source. We're going to look at a sermon on Romans 8.28. And then uh, another extract from a sermon on Revelation 3, verse 20. So here is the one from Romans 8, 28. He quotes Psalm 25, verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. And then he says this. Mark what he says. Make thou no exception where he makes none. All. Remember, he accepts nothing. Be thou therefore confirmed in thy faith and give glory to God and resolve with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. The Almighty may appear to be thine enemy for a time, that he may be thine everlasting friend. O oh, believer, after all thy sorrows and troubles and afflictions, thou must say at last with David, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. All the events that take place in the world carry on the same work, the glory of the Father and the salvation of his children. Every illness and infirmity that may seize you every loss you may meet with, every reproach you may endure, every shame that may color your faces, every sorrow in your hearts, every agony and pain in your bowels, every aching in your bones are for your good. Every change in your condition, your fair weather and your rough weather, your sunny and your cloudy weather, your ebbing and your flowing, your liberty and your imprisonment, all turn out for your good. O oh, Christians, see what a harvest of blessings ripens from this text. The Lord is at work. All creation is at work. Men and angels, friends and foes, all are busy working together for good. O oh, dear Dear Jesus, what hast thou seen in us that thou shouldest order things so wondrously for us and make all things, all things to work together for our good? And then we'll move on to the sermon from Revelation 3 and verse 20. Remember how? The Savior stands, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone will open to me, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. This is the Redeemer's voice to the sinner. Thou art naked, open to me, and I will clothe thee with mine own garments. Thou art blind, open to me. 
I have an eye salve that will make those see who are born blind. Thou art poor, open to me, and I will enrich thee with the unsearchable treasures of my grace. Thou art wretched, open to me, and then if my love, my blood, my consolations, my kingdom, myself can make thee happy. Happy thou shalt be. But if the sinner still refuses, what will the Son of God do but put on human infirmity and weep? See and behold the wonderful compassion of our dear Redeemer, if he should be asked, as Mary was, why weepest thou? He would say, not for my own sake, but because sinners choose rather to perish than to open to me, and will rather forsake me than forsake their sins. When I come to them, they will not know me. When I knock, they will not open. When I promise, they will not believe, as my compassions will not touch their hearts. There is no remedy for them. I hope you can feel, even though we're dealing with a translation, the power uh, of his ministry coming through in those very short extracts. As I've said, there were seven periods of revival during his 53 years of ministry. And we'll look at those uh, for which we have some details now. Uh, the first one began when he was still in that established church, the Church of England in Wales, um, in Llangaitho. And on this occasion, apparently, he was praying. And he was praying using the words of the litany where it says, by thine agony and bloody sweat, by thy cross and passion, by thy precious death and burial. And then the congregation answers, Lord, deliver us. But by the time the congregation got to the answer, uh, they were, many of them, on the floor and weeping because uh, the expression and the understanding that they were given of the work of Christ as their Redeemer. And apparently the Welsh language here is very expressive, more than uh, just thine agony. It's extreme agony. And the people melted away. And many, as uh, it subsequently turned out, were soundly converted. Uh, another revival began at a prayer meeting in Llangaifo. It's not known exactly how extensive it was, <clears throat> but uh, that revival spread through the means of prayer meetings and also of public ministry. And another revival began when the hymns of William Williams, the hymn writer, Pantakellen, uh, were first introduced to the congregation at Llangaifo. But perhaps one of the greatest ones uh, of the revivals took place a short time after Rowlands was ejected from the Church of England. It certainly called the Great Revival uh, in that it spread through all the counties of South Wales and many, many people were saved through it. And uh, it began at the chapel, not the church. If, if you go to if you go to South Wales, um, one of the questions you certainly used to be asked, and, and it, may be, uh, it may be true today as well, once, once you get to talk about your Christian faith and so on, somebody will ask you, are you church or chapel? In other words, are you from the Church of England, the established church, or are you a nonconformist, a dissenter? Church or chapel? So when you see chapel here, it's talking about after his ejection, and uh, it began while he was preaching in that chapel. Um, 
that was erected when he was thrown out of the Church of England. And we have a, an eyewitness account of it from somebody who says this, the whole chapel seemed to be filled with some supernatural element and the whole assembly was seized with extraordinary emotions. Hundreds of them with tears streaming down their faces, some evidently from excess of sorrow, others from the overflowing of joy, some broken and contrite with penitence, and others rejoicing with the hope of glory. And, uh, oh, didn't advance, there we are. And it may have begun when Rollins was reading Matthew 11, verse 25 and 26. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Which is an amazing thing to consider. One thing I wanted to mention, um, since we're dealing with a time of revival in these lectures, uh, is the fact that true revivals, as you study them through the history of the church, there are always certain characteristics. That there are great outpourings, there's great rejoicing, there are hundreds and thousands of people saved. But a work like that could not go on without opposition from the evil one. And almost always in a revival, that opposition takes at least these forms, maybe some others. There will be persecution. There will be division. Uh, if Satan can get in and sow division in the church, he's delighted to do so. There will be error, because he loves to uh, get people following off down a wrong track in their thinking and in their belief. And there will be counterfeit. There will be people who appear to be making a genuine profession uh, or to be having uh, some kind of outward spiritual experience, but um, it's questionable how genuine it is. And certainly the revival at the time of Rollins is no exception. So let's take a quick look at how this, uh, this opposition uh, manifested itself in his life. First, uh, as we've mentioned, he was ejected from the established church, the Church of England in Wales. Um, and that's because, uh, and you almost have to do a double take when you read words like this, because the authorities of the church did not appreciate what was going on under his ministry in terms of the revivals. They did not like the, uh, the shouting of praise and the, the outward manifestations of religious enthusiasm. They wanted everything to be nice and calm, nobody to rock the boat. And so he came into the church at Langaitho <clears throat> on one occasion and mounted the pulpit, was about to preach, and I think two or three uh, men in authority in the church came in and delivered a letter to him, which he opened and he read. And uh, the letter was to tell him that he may no longer preach in any of those two or three churches of, in which he was ministering at that time. And so he announced to the congregation, I am not permitted to preach, I have to leave. And they were astonished, and he walked out of the building, and just about everybody in the congregation walked out and followed him. Uh, I, I read an account that uh, in the Church of England in Langaitho, after he left, there was about uh, one man and, a, and an old woman left in the building to conduct worship. Meanwhile, all of those who appreciated his ministry set about constructing the new chapel um, across the river from the churches. And uh, his ministry continued there despite that attempt to close him down. Persecution um, took another form. 
He was thrown out of, of the church where he was ministering, but he was also mobbed in the open air. Others, like Howell Harris, I think, faced this far more than Daniel Rowlands. Uh, but uh, he went to a place called Llanaila in the county uh, where Llangaitho was. And a great crowd assembled, led by the squire of a nearby mansion, and started to throw stones and pieces of brick at him and other missiles, uh, such that he had to uh, stop preaching and to escape for his life, saying, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. This is not Daniel Rowlands. This actually, I think, is John Wesley. But you see, it's typical of the kind of scene with the mob, as, uh, as they were called, rent a mob um, who were always doing the bidding of the squires or, or, uh, or oftentimes doing that. Um, and uh, on one occasion, I think I, I read an account where somebody had actually rented a couple of his uh, uh, the people who were in the property that he owned to go and oppose Daniel Rowlands and to beat him up, and they went there. But there was such a gravity and such... Uh, a dignity and a power about his presence and about his delivery that uh, one of them sort of said, we can't do this. And the other one said, well, I will. And he said, well, if you go to hit him, I'll hit you harder than you've ever been hit in your life. And Daniel Rollins was spared on that occasion. Uh, division. Um, by 1750, uh, Howell Harris and Daniel Rollins were de facto the leaders of Calvinistic Methodism in Wales. Um, I think you may remember in the lecture on Whitfield, we saw how Whitfield was the moderator of the first assembly between the English Calvinistic Methodists and the Welsh. Uh, well, how Harris and Rowlands were at that meeting because they were clearly seen as the leaders of the Welsh body. Now, <clears throat> both of them held firmly to the proper deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's said that Daniel Rowlands and others uh, alongside him expressed that doctrine in terms that were rather indefinite and flat and colorless and didn't please Howell Harris. And Howell Harris came to a new realization of the glory of this doctrine and wasn't satisfied until everybody else saw it the way he did and expressed it the way he did, with all of the enthusiasm and the emotion uh, that he did. In fact, to others, he sounded like he was being somewhat rash and uh, harsh, maybe even irreverent in handling this doctrine. And the result was that uh, Harris and Rowlands parted company, and not in very good terms. Uh, so the evil one got in. It's not even that they believed different doctrines as, uh, as Wesley and Whitfield did. They believed the same thing. They expressed it in different ways. But that was enough. And they divided. <clears throat> and for all the time that they divided, the revival stopped. Um, so... If ever you want evidence of the work that the evil one can do and how, um, how a division among brothers and sisters in the Lord can bring the work of the Lord to a grinding halt, this would be it. Um, later on, that breach was repaired and the revival began again. Uh, I mentioned error as well. And uh, these are the ones that... Uh, we have evidence Rowlands particularly had to contend with during his life. We've, we've talked about Arminianism in the past, the idea that man somehow possesses the wit and the ability uh, all by himself to choose Christ to be his savior or to reject him. And uh, we know that that was foreign to certainly the teaching of Whitfield. It was foreign to the teaching of Daniel Rowlands and Howell Harris and, and many others of that day, but was a system uh, somewhat adopted by John Wesley and others, and uh, therefore taking a stand for the truth was something that Rowlands had to do in that regard. 
This was a surprise to me, and I have to do some more research on this, but uh, certainly it's recorded that this error called Baxterianism was another one that uh, Rowlands had to deal with. And it dates back to Richard Baxter, who has certainly written many very helpful works uh, during the Puritan era. But he seems to have been severely uh, misguided in this particular belief. If, if this account is true that I read, uh, Richard Baxter taught that whereas born into this world and left to his own devices, man has to keep the whole law of God and to keep it perfectly uh, to be righteous enough to earn salvation and therefore that is impossible for him to achieve. What Christ did was enough to bring that threshold down he didn't bring it down to nothing, though, which is the true gospel, that we, we can do nothing and we have to do nothing but believe in order to be saved. He brought it down to some kind of midway point where we can now do enough, and it's our works that have to get us over that threshold. Um, that was an error that Rollins had to deal with. Uh, and counterfeit. Um, this is not an, an, an account of genuine counterfeit, but it certainly shows how there can be these problems in a time of revival. People began spontaneously while he was preaching. They were so filled with the Spirit of God and with the joy of the gospel that they began to jump for joy. Um, maybe you know that song of, of the lame man who was healed who went leaping and jumping and praising God. Well, that's what these people were doing because the realities of heaven were made so present to them uh, through the power of this man's ministry that they would jump. <clears throat> now, Rollins, for his part, neither encouraged them to do so nor discouraged them from doing it. Nor did he discourage or encourage all of the other outward expressions uh, that took place during his ministry, shouting aloud in praise, crying, weeping, uh, people throwing themselves down, overcome by a sense of their sin, or else shouting glory and hallelujah because they had such a sense of the mercy and the grace of God in the gospel. Now, you will know from some things that I have said that the English tend to be a little bit more subdued and restrained and don't tend to show our emotions on our sleeves. The, the Welsh, however, have a Celtic um, spirit and you'll, you, you see it in the hymns and in the tunes that they write. You've seen it in some of the words that we have read today. They have much more emotion and uh, that's a good thing, rightly expressed in religion. If our religion is not a religion of emotion, then it's worthless. Not emotionalism, but emotion. Now, some in England, seeing what was going on in Wales, <clears throat> were rather critical. Perhaps they thought this was a counterfeit, or it could give rise to people just trying to imitate <clears throat> all this jumping and shouting and so on. And so one of them wrote to to Rollins and, and sort of addressed him on it and said, you know, I'm not sure you should allow this to happen. And Rollins replied, you English blame us, the Welsh, and speak against us and say, jumpers, jumpers. But we, the Welsh, have something also to allege against you and we most justly say of you, sleepers, sleepers. Now, would you like to be a sleeper or a jumper? And I know I'm English, but I think I would like to be a jumper on this occasion. Uh, that was the end of the criticism, though. But you could see how uh, those kind of outward manifestations and the kind of dynamic that happen in a crowd, these things can be mimicked and they can be done in the flesh and not in the spirit. I think Rollins was wise uh, to say nothing about it, neither to quench the spirit, 
by trying to stop those who were truly expressing their inward sense of joy or of conviction, um, but also not, uh, not encouraging those, perhaps, who had no such sense to go ahead and do it uh, in a false way. Well, <clears throat> those are some of the characteristics of his ministry and some of the ways that the Lord blessed it. Uh, now, uh, after living a very long life, 54 years of ministry, he was 77, I think, when he died. <clears throat> uh, or he was, yes, 78. He was in the 79th year of his life. He had prayed, as I think George Whitfield did also, that he might not suffer a long and enduring sickness. And the Lord answered that prayer. And he was taken ill on Friday the 14th of October 1790, and, uh, on Wednesday the 14th, and died two days later, October the 16th, uh, 1790. He had ministered for 53 years. And uh, since he passed away on the Friday and there was no easy way for news to be communicated and people were coming to hear him from 20, 40, 60 miles, they gathered on that Sunday unaware that he had passed away and expecting the blessing of sitting under his ministry again. And you can imagine they were devastated. Uh, here had been a man who had been the shepherd of their souls under God for 50 years, whose ministry had been consistently empowered by the Spirit of God to the transforming of lives and of their society. And now they show up and he has gone to be with the Lord. And a tremendous uh, grieving began. And uh, his son Nathaniel succeeded him in the ministry at Langaitho. And as I said, for some 20 years afterwards, it still remained a focus this tiny little village in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Wales, was still a focus for great blessing uh, on the ministry of the gospel. Well, we've tried to look at what we might learn um, as we've considered the lives of these men that God has raised up. One thing that I would like to point out, which has been occurring to me as I was preparing this lecture, is, is this. Don't get put off by seeing you, you have these luminaries, Whitfield, Rowlands, Wesley, Top Lady. Uh, and if we don't get men like that in this generation, then there is no hope. Uh, that is not true. If you look at the accounts, yes, these were the leaders, these were luminaries, these were men that God raised up and, and blessed their ministry in extraordinary ways. But there were literally dozens and dozens of others working uh, quite powerfully and quite effectively who, who we know relatively little about. Griffith Jones, uh, who was the man who actually was responsible under God for arresting uh, Rollins in his vanity and his conceit um, through prayer. Uh, and there are others. There are, there are many, many more. So... There is a place for you and for, for myself in this work. Just because we may not see a Whitfield today or a Rowlands today doesn't mean that the Lord can't use us and use us mightily. And who knows but that he might uh, bring someone among us or gift someone among us to play a role like this uh, in the United States. So what should we learn? I didn't think I could do better than to take the words of one of the authors that I read, uh, John Owen, not the Puritan John Owen, but a historian writing in the 19th century that uh, Ryle borrowed from, or certainly consulted, in uh, preparing his two chapters in the Christian Leaders book. This is what John Owen says, and he's talking about the grief in the congregation at Langaitha, robbed of this great man after so long and so much blessing. He says this, What moderates and alleviates all grief and sorrow of this kind is the thought and the truth 
But the fountain of all goodness remains the same, endures still, and will ever continue full, and will be ever sufficient for the supply of all wants. He who endowed Whitfield, and I have added Wesley and Top Lady, and Rowlands, has the same power still. May the author of all good favor this country and all countries with men of similar gifts and of a similar spirit and bless them with similar and even more abundant success. Amen. These are uh, the sources that, uh, that I looked at and uh, I can certainly let you have these later. You don't need to try and jot them down in the dark now. Uh, but uh, I think it boils down to the fact of them all consulting pretty much the same people who knew Rollins or who knew people who'd heard Rollins uh, because there is so little um, written material available. But what there is, I think, is wonderful and hopefully has been uh, as much of an encouragement to you in, in reviewing it tonight as it was to me in preparing it. So perhaps if we could get the lights, then um, we'll see if there are any questions. Okay, so, are there any questions? Yes, at the back. Where his heart really was. Right, well, if you remember, um, early on, before he came to know the Lord Jesus, he was working in a church and he was um, in the pulpit in the morning reading the lessons, the, the scriptures and so on and so forth and he spent the rest of the day in sports and games and, and foolish activities with all of his friends who used to profane the Lord's Day. And the question was, where did he prefer to be, in the church or playing the games? Where was his heart? What would he rather have been doing? The games. Yeah, he didn't go reluctantly, sort of dragged kicking and screaming out to play sports in the afternoon um, after he had been in the pulpit in the morning. That was everything he wanted to do. He preferred that um, greatly. Something that you young people may think of as well. Uh, where is your heart? Where do you prefer to be? Uh, in the church, worshipping the Lord and, and with his people, or out playing games, and uh, those are okay in their place, but on the Lord's Day, there are far, far better things to use the time that the Lord gives us for. Any other questions? Donna. What is the <clears throat> well, the Church of England, the, the Church of England has um, a liturgy, so it is known. I can tell. Well, if I had the book here, I could tell you exactly what all of the scripture readings will be. And the things called the collects. There's a backwards and forwards between the congre congregation and the and the vicar, um, and the whole service is pretty much laid out, and the lessons are the scripture readings for a given. Uh, service. Um, sad to say, um, when, when Pam and I were looking uh, at the church where we would get married, um, we went into the Anglican church in her hometown because that was very much um, a place that uh, members of, of the family might have wanted us to be married and we had to play spot the sermon. Um, and we missed. <laughs> we blinked and we missed it. 
So that, that's, that's what that is. And, and certainly, the, the, the prayer book is actually, um, it's full of really good stuff. Cranmer put it together. And um, the 39 articles of the church are, are full of very sound doctrine. The problem is that the church doesn't really use those anymore. Any other? Yes, Carla. Did you have any more information on the transition between when his brother was the vicar and when he became the um, vicar? How that well, changed? <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure he ever did. Bec I think his brother kept the living, and he probably remained as curate. But you, as the curate, you get to stand in when the vicar is away. And since they had charge of two or three congregations, I imagine he would be filling the pulpit while his brother was somewhere else, and then, then they would swap. So I think he remained a curate. Um, I think his salary was something like, was it 10 pounds a year or something? <coughs> something that doesn't sound like very much today. Um, but yes, then he was thrown out uh, for being too much of an enthusiast and stirring up the people. Um, any other questions, Kathy? Um, I wasn't catching the years or dates when some of these revivals occurred. Do you, right. do you have any feel for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Except it was sometime between 1713 and 1790 um, when he was born and when he died. Well, actually, um, you, could, you could narrow it down even more because he, uh, he was ordained. Yeah. But that's one of the problems that we have is there is so little written material. It's largely anecdotal and, you know, I'm not very good at remembering dates when things happen, so, but I can certainly remember hearing some great preachers and I can tell you about the effects that that had upon me quite accurately. I couldn't tell you the date when it happened, though, so I think that's what's, what's going on here. No, they were contemporary. And, um, well, obviously Whitfield sat in the communion service, the sacrament, when Rowlands was, was ministering and felt the power of his ministry. And, um, and then moderated that first assembly of the Welsh and English Calvinistic Methodist at which... Rowlands was present, so they were, they were co-laborers at the time. Was there another? Yes? Where did you get your sources for, for Rowlands? Uh, sermons, and are they available? Are they easy to get if someone wanted them? Uh, yes, they are easy to get. The, first, the book that we've used to provide the backdrop for this whole series is um, an Anglican bishop, um, a very good one, Bishop John Charles Ryle, J.C. Ryle. R-Y-L-E, wrote a book called Christian Leaders of the 18th Century. And he covers all of these characters, um, Whitfield, Wesley, Top Lady, and Rowlands, and others. Uh, so you'll, you'll, have the, you'll see that the Lord didn't just raise up these. There were the several completely independently in different parts of the country just appeared on the scene, tremendously gifted, and, uh, and made very effective uh, Ryle, in putting his two chapters together on Daniel Rowlands, uh, dipped into um, another work by John, uh, a, a character called John Owen, who was a historian from the early 19th century. And you can, if you go onto Google Books um, and search for Daniel Rowlands and John Owen, you will find there probably, um, it's probably about 150 pages long, uh, so you get more detail than, than Ryle used, so that's quite good. Um, William Williams, um, also on Google Books, uh, a history of Welsh Calvinistic Methodism, and he has quite a few places where he deals with Roland amongst all of the characters in the Welsh uh, body of Calvinistic Methodism at that time. And then there was one other um, character. Um, William Henry Clark, who wrote a history of the Church of Wales, 
But I think by Church of Wales, he means Church of England in Wales. So he means the established church. But it's very difficult to deal with that um, without dealing with the fact that Daniel Rowlands, who was being used mightily by God, was thrown out of the church for his troubles. And many of them write about what a tragedy it was and that that was done in the church uh, to Daniel Rowlands. What a tragedy for the church that they did that to him. So those are the, um, the works that I consulted. There are others as well. If you search on the internet, I think Martin Lloyd-Jones has done a paper and various people have written um, little essays and, and, and articles. Right, okay. Um, it, it may not be called Christian leaders of the 18th century, but if you do J.C. Ryle, Christian leaders with him. Right, so if you search on Google Books for J.C. Ryle, Christian leaders, I think when it was first published, because he wrote it in the 19th century, the book was titled Christian Leaders of the Last Century. Um, so if, that may be what it's called on, uh, on Google Books. This is kind of a, an aside question, but this Wednesday, where will the um, church meet and what will the topic be? Ah, yes, that is an aside question. It'll meet at our house and it'll be chapter 10 of the Soul Winner book. By Spurgeon. By Spurgeon. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you know, there were the awakenings in England and the awakening, the Great Awakening here happening around the same time. Mm -hmm. What was happening, what preceded that? Is there, is, there, is there a through time when there's been great revivals and outpouring? Is there, was there something that preceded that happening? And, because, and is, there, is there any sign that that could be happening today? <laughs> right. Uh, well, yes, in one sense. What preceded certainly the revival in uh, Great Britain and, and in the British Isles was a period of tremendous darkness, depravity, um, where the Lord had been abandoned. Um, but the whole nation of England, it, it's thought, and in the estimation of secular historians, uh, was about to get plunged into a revolution similar to the one that they had in France. There were gin palaces, there was wantonness, there was every kind of wickedness and immorality that you can imagine. <clears throat> so, and I think that was probably true over in the States as well before the Great Awakening here. And it's been true many times in the history of revival. And it makes sense um, because... The, the glory of the Lord will be seen much more clearly when it stands out against a, a dark background. Um, so what else has oftentimes preceded revival is that the Lord will lay upon the hearts of a few of his children, sometimes as few as two, some, two sometimes a congregation, a tremendous burden about the state of things, a burden that they can find no relief for and they cast themselves before the Lord and they cry out to him and the Lord gives them the grace to cry out with tremendous power and, and effectiveness. And then, having given them the prayer and given them the burden, the Lord sends the Spirit uh, and the fire comes down. Uh, it's all of him. It's all his grace. We can't, we can't work up a revival. We can't grit our teeth and, and say, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to believe for a revival. Um, you know, there are meetings in the UK and perhaps over here that are called revivals. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Um, it's the Lord's work. We can't say, we'll have a revival a week next Friday, 7 o'clock, be there or be square. Uh, was that part of it? 
the enthusiasm was part of it. Also, the fact they did not like the fact, and this was true with um, Whitfield and Wesley as well. In the, in the Church of England, they, they were reformed from Rome, but they weren't totally reformed. And so you still have the idea, and, some, and this lives on in other churches as well, dissenting and nonconformist churches. You still have the idea that somehow the, the place where the meeting happens, it's, it's, it is consecrated. They have this service of consecration. So it's a consecrated building. It's holy ground. And that is the place where the holy word of God should be preached by the priest. Uh, and, and they are called priests in, uh, now, at least, but the vicar. And so um, to, to step outside consecrated ground and preach the gospel to the people was a terrible thing to do, believe it or not. And so it's for those two things, um, the enthusiasm, all of the effects of the revivals that were, that were happening under his ministry, um, and taking the word of God out and preaching it in unconsecrated places. Right. Uh, whenever there is... The attendant emotion was maybe this did. Uh, and yet we're still genuine revivals. Right. And I, I know, um, well, I, I believe I know, Jonathan Edwards wrote Religious Affections because of this need to be able to discern between a true work of the Spirit of God in revival in, in New England uh, contemporaneously with this activity and the counterfeit because the, the, the devil can appear as an angel of light and he, he especially does that at times of revival because at the least he can sow confusion hopefully division as he did here error and uh, you know from the moment a revival breaks out he's working overtime to try and stamp it out and, and, uh, and squash out the truth and stop people from coming to know the Lord. Yeah. In Jonathan Edwards' preaching, people were also fell out underneath the power of, the, of his preaching, correct? They did, yeah. And I mean, the, the story is told of... of and, and he was by no means you know, charismatic with a small C, not, uh, not the, gifts of the charismatic gifts of the Spirit. He was not a charismatic preacher by all accounts. He would stand in his pulpit with, carry, holding a candle in one hand and reading his sermon and he read his sermon sinners in the hands of an angry God and people were hanging on to the pillars in the church and to anything that was solid because they felt that the ground was about to open up and swallow them into hell um, you could hardly say that he stirred them up by his uh, manipulation or so on it was entirely a work of, of the spirit of God and we have that to look forward to Next year, I imagine that Sean will be preaching on Jonathan Edwards, <laughs> however. Yes, Ty. You would conclude then that there are no sleeper cells that should be in existence if the revival is going on because it should be preceded to prayer. <laughs> we preach new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not evident when somebody is asleep sometimes whether they're truly alive. Uh, sometimes you have to hold a mirror up to see if they can fog, fog the mirror. I don't think at any time in the church we want to have sleepers. Um, but you certainly won't see quite so many of them at a time of revival as at other times. I hope none of us want to be sleepers here. Would that be the first occurrence of this concept in sleeper cells? <laughs> I doubt it. It wasn't a concept, sadly. It was a reality. Anything else? 